Let us pray. God, we give thanks for this wonderful story, this wondrous story of the king, the prophet, the priest, the Messiah, the one who entered Jerusalem on a donkey. And our prayer this morning, God, is that you would continue to enter into our lives, that we will continue to cry out, Hosanna, that we will continue to welcome you. May there be more of you and less of me in the things that I say. And may your spirit be present to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For the last six weeks of Lent, we've had this theme of again and again. Because we've remembered that Lent is a cycle that happens every year in the church. And again and again, we visit the desert places in order to be reminded of our need for Christ. And again and again, Palm Sunday comes up in our liturgical calendar, the week before Easter, and again and again, we have this Sunday to celebrate God's presence in our lives. Because again and again, we're invited to welcome Jesus. Just as Jesus entered into Jerusalem, we're invited to welcome Jesus into our lives. But what does that mean? If we have a look at the the story from 2,000 years ago, I want to suggest to you, 2,000 years ago, it was not exactly remarkable for someone to enter Jerusalem on a donkey. I reckon that would have been a daily occurrence. That would have happened all the time. It's a bit like saying someone entered Brisbane in a, driving a Hyundai Getz. It's not that big a deal, right? So why was it such a big deal? I want to suggest it wasn't the fact that the, a man rode a donkey into Jerusalem, but rather who it was and what was the occasion. So central to this idea of what we celebrate each Palm Sunday is this central question that we find right throughout Scripture. In the three synoptic Gospels, who do you say that I am? We find this question in the heart, the centre of the Gospels. In John's Gospel, we don't have that question per se, but we have three I am statements where Jesus proclaims who he is. Because central to the Christian story is the identity of Christ. And I want to suggest to you all that we will not understand the power of this story unless we answer this question. Who is it that we say Jesus is? Why is it significant for Jesus to enter Jerusalem on a donkey? Why is it, when Jesus does it, it's, it's this huge big occasion where for all the 20 other people who did it every day, or the 50 or 100 people who did it every day, no one batted an eyelid. How we answer this question is how we understand the significance of this story. The Christian apologist C.S. Lewis said, when it comes to answering this question, he famously said, there there are three ways to answer this question. Jesus was either a liar or a lunatic or Lord. In other words, C.S. Lewis said, Jesus either deliberately deceived people about who he was, a very sinister and evil person who lied about his identity. For C.S. Lewis, he, he could not, when he read the scriptures, he just could not imagine Jesus deliberately deceiving people about his identity, so he crossed that out. Perhaps Jesus was a total lunatic, a crazy man, who who thought that he was the saviour of the world. I mean, a total fruit loop. But again, C.S. Lewis, in reading of his scripture, thought the profound things that Jesus said didn't sound like a crazy person. And so C.S. Lewis was left with the conclusion that Jesus must, must have been fair dinkum, must have been Lord. Now, we may not come to that conclusion, and that was C.S. Lewis's journey of faith, but I want to suggest to you that the writers of the New Testament had three things in mind too when they tell this story. It wasn't liar, lunatic, or lord, but it was prophet, priest, or king. So if we do, when I say prophet, the, I, the story of Jesus entering into Jerusalem on a donkey was prophesied. Zechariah told the story of the coming king who would enter into Jerusalem, not on a stallion, not on a war horse, as was the custom, but on a donkey. 
And it's fair to say that Jesus knew this prophecy, as did his disciples. So as we read this story, we can see that Jesus is preparing them. I want you to go ahead. We've already arranged this thing. I want you to, to find the, the people who have the donkey for me. They're going to set it up. We're going to enter into Jerusalem on a donkey because that's what the prophecy said. People have been waiting for more than 500 years for this prophecy to be fulfilled. And there was a great sense of expectation that Jesus was the Messiah. So by entering in on a donkey, everyone rallied around. They thought, maybe Jesus is the one. People thought that, and as they, as they told this story, as they prepared for Jesus to come in to Jerusalem on a donkey, they also thought of Jesus as the great high priest, the one who could be the, the, like the conduit between heaven and earth for the people of Israel. And there is an ancient story of Abraham sacrificing or going to sacrifice his son and by putting his son on a donkey to take him to the altar. Of course, we know in the story that Abraham didn't sacrifice his son, but that story is symbolic and representative of the idea that God's own son would become the sacrifice. So when Jesus enters into Jerusalem on a donkey, he is like the ultimate Isaac being prepared to be the sacrifice for all of Israel. And of course, there is a notion that Jesus was the king. And and a week later, when Jesus crucified, it said on the cross, the king of the Jews. And we find in the history of the Hebrew Bible, what we now call the Old Testament, the story of, of Solomon. King Solomon entering into Jerusalem on a donkey, King David's mule. So prophet, priest and king sit within the Old Testament canon of these wonderful stories preparing people for when the king, the promised king comes to Jerusalem, he will ride on a donkey, which is all well and good if you're an Israelite in the first century, this is exactly what you expect, this is what you're looking for, this is what you're hoping for and they line the streets in, in expectation and celebration. But prophet, priest and king, they aren't the language that people in Brisbane talk about in the 21st century. We don't, when we talk about prophets, we spell it with an F, not a PH, and we're talking about multinational companies and the stock exchange. When we talk about priests, there's normally a, a number of scandals that go along with that, and it'd be fair to say that the word priest in our society does not have the, the reverence and respect that it used to. And when we talk about kings, well, I mean, my wife's obsessed with the Netflix Crown series, but apart from that, we don't, and, you know, if there's a royal scandal, we'll all read the papers, but apart from that, even in Australia, as part of the Commonwealth, most of us probably don't understand the language of the monarchy and and what a king is, certainly not in ancient times compared to now. So I want to suggest we need to find three other words that might help us make sense of this story in a contemporary setting. What was happening here? Well, I want to suggest to you that, and contemporary scholars have had a look at this parade, this entry into Jerusalem, and tried to make sense of what it might look like today. And so some of the language around that is that Jesus was an activist, that what he was doing was drawing attention to what was happening in the politics of Jerusalem at that time. So. Scholars, New Testament scholars and historians have, have uh, recently come to understand that it was a regular custom, certainly under Pontius Pilate, that each Passover, in preparation, so in Passover in Jerusalem, the, the city would swell by about 20 to 50,000 people. And so Pontius Pilate, who normally lived um, not in Jerusalem, but in Caesarea, would come into Jerusalem on a stallion with a huge big parade, a bit like one of those military parades we see now in different countries. They would come into the, into the city full of pomp and ceremony to remind people during this time, as people come for Passover, just to remind them that Rome was in charge. This was, some scholars think, was perhaps happening the same day. And so Jesus enters in by another gate, having another parade as a bit of a parody, a bit of street theatre, a bit of a mockery, if you like, of what Pontius Pilate was doing and saying, I'm not riding on a war horse, I'm riding on a donkey because my kingdom is very different to the empire of Rome. Perhaps that was what was happening. Jesus was an activist and he was doing something to draw attention 
to what was happening in Rome at the time. One of the words that uh, people may use to describe Jesus now is a celebrity. And I, and I think there's, there's a sense to this. We live in an age of celebrity. We have people on, on YouTube or on reality TV shows who are famous for being famous. No other reason. They're just famous. They're celebrities. And we love it. Society loves it. And we are infatuated by it. And what we end up doing is projecting upon other people our own desires, our own needs, our own wants. We sometimes do that in our relationships. But this kind of infatuation, this kind of celebrity worship is a very dangerous thing. And we see that in this story. That everyone's welcoming Jesus and singing Hosanna and then a week later they shout out, crucify him, because Jesus is not who they expect him to be. Every celebrity we put up on a pedestal is going to fall and fall hard. We need to be careful and ask ourselves why we do that. Why we expect others to fulfill the wants and desires that that we want in our lives, we project it onto them, we set them up and then they fall really hard. And we can see that in the story of Jesus entering Jerusalem and being crucified. And some would think of Jesus as a mystic. The etymology of mystic and mystery is, is in the ancient world a person who would reveal the things that were hidden. And we see that this in the life of Christ. One of the things that Jesus did was, was like lift the lid on Old Testament Judaism. Lift the lid on the law and what was expected. Lift the lid on the religious customs and rituals that, that oppressed people. Lift the lid on the powers and principalities of the Roman Empire. And we, we see in, in Mark chapter 4 a beautiful description of this. Jesus would say, Why, if you're going to light a lamp, you don't put it under the bed. And he, he implored his, his followers, his disciples, for those who have ears to hear, what I'm saying to you is not a great mystery. I'm actually revealing the things that you think are hidden. They're not. What's the law and the prophets? To love God and to love your neighbor. If we have a look at the psalm that people were singing on this day 2,000 years ago, we heard of a, a bit of it uh, read this morning. I'm going to read a couple of verses that were omitted and you'll, you'll get the sense there's a theme here. Reading from verse 1, O give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. And at the end of the psalm, it says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. It's the, it's the song that never ends, that keeps going and going. His steadfast love endures forever. The word in Hebrew for steadfast love is chesed. It means loving kindness. And the sense here is, the celebrations that are, are being sung as Jesus enters in Jerusalem is this is the one whose love endures forever. Despite our failings, despite our weaknesses, despite our fears and our doubts, despite all that's gone wrong, despite all that we've done wrong, despite all the wrong that has been done to us, God's steadfast love endures forever. This this doesn't have to be celebrity love. This doesn't have to be um, hero worship. It doesn't have to be idolatry. The sort of love that Jesus is embodying here isn't the sort of love that we find in a song or in a poem or some, some wonderful idea and explanation. This love is found in a person, Jesus. And this person is on a donkey. This Jesus, this love that enters Jerusalem on a donkey, that enters Brisbane in a Hyundai Getz, what, whatever the explanation is, it's, it's not what you would expect. And so the answer to the question of who do you say that I am, the one that we find in Scripture, the one that is repeated down through the ages, it's not that those other answers aren't, aren't okay, it's just that they're not adequate, they're not, they're not enough. There is a word to describe who Jesus is. 
And it's the word that is on the lips of people as they welcome him in. And it's, it's this, that Jesus is the Messiah. He's more than a prophet and a priest and a king. He's more than, than an activist and a, and a celebrity. Jesus is the Messiah, the saviour of the world, the one who forgives our sins, the one who forgives those who have sinned against us, the one who empowers us to love others. And when we welcome Jesus into our lives, not just through a, a, a prayer that we might pray, but through lives that we choose to live ourselves, when we welcome Jesus into our lives the way that those first disciples welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem, we need to understand that things are going to go upside down. Jesus is the Messiah, but not the one that we hope for, not the one that we long for, not the one that, that we want and desire. Jesus is the Messiah who calls us and forgives us and empowers us to love and forgive others. And when we catch hold of that, we begin to catch a glimpse of what this Easter season is all about. Let's pray. Thank you, God, that as Messiah, as Saviour, Jesus comes into our lives. We pray for all of us here this morning, and especially little Blair, that you might come into our lives to turn our world upside down, not to meet our expectations or our hopes or our desires, but rather that we might be transformed by your love the things we have not even imagined. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.